<laughs> Please welcome Rook. Give it up. Um, I've been in security for 20 years, uh, largely as a go-to-market leader at companies like Rapid7. Oh, just a little bit. Uh, Rapid7, which is based in Boston. I was employee six there, uh, and I worked there until there were 600 employees. Um, also, Bugcraft is a good group my company. Oh, yeah. Um, Bugcraft is based is really good. exciting. And then most recently at Sonatype before starting KSOC. Uh, I'm also a girls on the run coach. For those of you who haven't heard, if you've heard of that, you can make any good That's cool. Uh, girls on the run is an organization that helps to empower young women. They teach them leadership, leadership skills. And we also run the team. Um, and I'm an EWF mentor. Um, so I'm also the mom to Maddie, who is a Swifty. She just turned 12. Uh, Miles, who's a big basketball fan, and uh, my husband is Ted Lasso here from a meeting about Holland, who is uh, at Temple, so we're a cybersecurity couple. And then I love to connect with y'all on LinkedIn out there, and so there's my LinkedIn if you want to connect. All right, let's get started. So I think it's important <laughs> to talk about uh, the evolution of the game to start. Uh, so I'm what's considered a zennial, which is the cusp of millennial and Gen Z. And so that means I was brought up in business by people who have really strong work ethic, um, but I also am skeptic sometimes, and I trend towards being way overly optimistic with millennials. Um, but my leaders and mentors that mentioned that brought me up in business didn't necessarily look like me. They perceived vulnerability to be they had a very commanding, controlling style, and I don't know, for those of you who were around in the you know, 2000s and 90s, there was uh, a period where charisma and being extroverted was rewarded and encouraged in leadership. If you weren't that way, if you were slightly introverted or like to keep to yourself, you weren't considered a potential leader which would eliminate an entire generation of leaders in this day and age. And so our generation was, uh, by some people, the Gaucho Trail generation. And for those of you who have related, this is what it looks like. And I was pretty good at it, but I did die just in time along the way. So. <laughs> Has anyone played Oregon Trail? Yeah, yeah OK. Good, I'm glad somebody gets up. So, um, being a female leader in this industry uh, brings up some additional challenges. I don't know if anybody's ever heard the question as a woman in uh, security, are you technical? Has anybody ever? <laughs> could, I, could I speak to your co-founder? I get that sometimes. Um, are you um, in sales or marketing? I definitely have a cyber to it. I get treated like an EA on a regular basis in scheduling meetings with myself and my co-founder. They'll send me the availability. Um, anyhow, uh, I've been told crazy things like the board would prefer a man in your position. Um, has any woman ever heard this? You're not mean enough as a leader if you're a leader. That's very common. I mentor a lot of women. And it's, um, it's a different approach that a lot of male leaders take. They expect to just to replicate that style. Um, and so I struggled early in my career with identity and creating a brand for myself. Uh, and I questioned, like, who am I as a leader? Because I'm being told by men to be this way and not that way. And I wasn't sure exactly uh, who to be. Along that point, this is me and my dad. Pictured, unfortunately, I lost him a few years ago to suicide. Um, but the beauty of that is when you lose somebody, especially somebody really close to you, you have a wake up call moment. And you really assess what's important and what's valuable in your life. And so that was the turning point for me. And I told you my daughter's a Swifty, so she helped me with this presentation. For those of you who don't know, it's T Swift. Uh, and during that turning point, I had a mentor call with a friend of mine. Her name's Jen Benson. And she worked at Rapid Seven Days and had customer success. And I said to her, Jen, sometimes I feel like I'm not 
as feminine as I used to be. I'm surrounded by all these men who tell me to be like that. I'm struggling. Where do I fit in? I'm not quite sure. And so she and I spoke a lot about um, the next step in my career. And so at that, at that point, she said to me, and I put my word down, without psychological safety, you cannot embrace femininity. And I was like, oh, that's exactly what it is. And so I've had some really amazing people in my life who have helped me, including Jen, my husband is super supportive, our investors from 420 Capital, Ula, who have really led the charge in helping me and making it through this transition so that I could build my identity as my own strong woman. And so all of that was fuel for success. So here are some facts. Um, being different, it doesn't have to be bad. It can be really good. Um, and so last year, female CEOs saw 20% increase in stock price <coughs> momentum a 6% increase in profitability, and 8% larger stock returns. Um, another fun fact, women uh, CEOs finally don't remember those named John, uh, which uh, is crazy. 10% uh, of the Fortune 500 uh, uh, CEOs are now women. And uh, high gender diversity on boards leads to higher profitability, which is uh, really good. We still have a lot of work to do. Um, female founders and CEOs, especially in startups, um, often take more dilution than their male counterparts. So there's some good work that still needs to be done there, but at least some good progress is being made uh, in the right direction. So we've been talking about the empathy evolution. I wanted to tell you a story. So this is my son. Uh, he's the basketball guy on the far left. Um, he thinks he's going to be the MVP. Don't tell me short. <laughs> Maybe, we don't know. We could have still have a chance. Um, in this school, they teach from the moment that their little kids all through uh, their journey in school about empathy. Like, they would have been so cool if that was a core character uh, focus for all of us growing up. And so these are some of the things that they teach in school. But uh, during basketball games, uh, uh, recently, a boy fell and the entire team wanted to go over to help, to help them up, and that's the stark contrast to what we saw growing up. Um, you know, the, the coaches would say things like, shake it off, rub some dirt in it, and so it's really nice to see this next generation of kids growing up with a tremendous focus on the And so it's also a shift that's happening in the workplace. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, of course, but um, with the shift towards AI, uh, empathy is really important um, to allow for us to connect with other individuals. Uh, empathy uh, is not even just encouraged at Microsoft, but it's also a requirement. Um, and I spoke to a friend and mentor who worked uh, at Microsoft for many years, and uh, she was talking to me about the dimensions of success at Microsoft, and I really love the first one because it's not just about a focus on individual results, but how those results will impact the success of everyone else. And so I think that that's a really cool core value um, that I'm taking with me on my journey. Yeah. Another thing that KSOP is doing in our company uh, in order to encourage empathy is we. Um, we think about our employees as they're going through their journey in parenthood and have a very generous paternity policy, not just maternity policy. I remember when my kids were born and my husband had to go to work after two weeks and I was just left alone with my first child, not knowing anything about raising a child. And that's really hard for a lot of people. And so it's important that dads get that time as well. Um, we also do uh, free charge Fridays and lots of different things. Uh, so as you think about where you want to work or how you want to be as a leader, it's really important to think about empathy in the workplace and to find examples and response where you can see that. So for what are the things that get in our way when we think about empathy? Uh, if you've ever been to dinner and seen a bunch of people, I know my daughter and her 12 year old friends, which my daughter had a birthday party recently. Every single girl is just, they weren't doing this, and I'm a little 
phones. But uh, they were on their phones all the time. It's just crazy. And so it makes it a little bit more challenging to be present. And so these are five things that we can take away from here and uh, use to our advantage. So be present, active listening. It's often good to restate things that you hear from people to make sure that they feel heard, um, especially as leaders. And especially with everything happening with AI uh, and technology. So we are doing some good work in shifting away from empathy as a perceived weakness. Uh, and that takes a lot of work, not just from the women that we surround ourselves, but also from advocates in the community that are helping us uh, to shift that mindset. Women often lead differently in different ways. It's really hard to help other people if we don't invest in ourselves. And so this morning I was thinking about this presentation and I felt a little bit like, oh, I'm nervous, I'm not. And I went right to the gym and I didn't want to go at all. But it's really hard to help other people if you don't help yourself, if you don't invest in yourself. And so take a minute, go to the gym, go for a walk, eat something healthy, meditate, just sit alone for 10 minutes. Um, these are the things that can help you to really connect with other people. And if you've ever noticed conflict at work, I think so much conflict at work happens as a result of incorrect assumptions. When you get super stressed, you can feel like that person is doing something malicious, or that person is doing something um, that's not helping our company grow or succeed. And um, if you operate under the assumption that everyone's trying to do good and what's in everyone's best interest, help. And then it's good to do all of these things, but to show that you truly care, to follow up, is everything. You know, afterwards, checking with that person who had a conversation with, seeing what they're doing today. All right, so. Last, uh, not last, but one of the last things that I want to leave you with is that uh, a Meryl Streep quote. Um, and so I know everyone here is super busy and it's tough to form human connection, but um, if we take a minute to connect with others, it can be really important um, to, to connect with other people. And so I wanted to leave with <laughs> A little bit of an exercise and some more the thoughts. But if everyone, <laughs> I know, I'm awkward. If you see in Shit's Creek. Um, so I am awkward sometimes. But I wanted us to just have a minute where we met other people that are in this room together and maybe just introduce ourselves. <laughs> You're laughing or you not into it. Um, but I thought we could. Was awesome. that? This is awesome. I think we could. I mean, why yes. not? This is a small group. Um, so if you could just take a minute to introduce yourself to a neighbor, and you can tell them whatever you want, but you could say, I am, and for me, I'm a mom, I'm a CEO, I'm a coach, I am, whatever it is that you are, or something maybe that somebody would know about you right away. And then if you feel really ambitious, if you get really connected with them often after to maintain that relationship. So that's it for me. That one might be a faster than I did this morning. But, um, Hopefully, there's some good notes in here, and that's it. Any questions before we introduce each other to each other? So, as CEO, so that you're, you're building out this endeavor, what are you doing to kind of incorporate that vulnerability and that messaging into Processes, practice, and you know, what are you doing to signal below you, you know, to make sure that that stays there? That's a good question. I think part of it is by doing it. Okay. Like I shared with you a very vulnerable story of my father today, and, I, and I'm okay with doing that now. I think right away when it happened, I probably wasn't. But um, I think one, leading by example, two, making sure your leaders are empowered to be vulnerable and give them that psychological safety that I talked about earlier, to, um, to also be vulnerable, um, making sure that people realize there isn't one size fits all solution to leadership. Um, 
and um, really investing in our people. And so, that's a question. Yeah, question. perfect, thank you. Is there another question? Um, and a lot, a lot of these things where we have like the old way we used to do things, you know, rub some dirt in it, and now, now we're trying to improve upon that. It's usually like the pendulum swing. Do you feel like we're on the course of swinging too far into empathy, or we haven't even we haven't reached the amplitude where it should come back? Like, where do you find the balance between cuddling and being empathetic and supporting people, like finding that balance? Yeah, there are days that I don't always know that. Know, because I trend towards being very empathetic. And I read something this morning that talked about like leaders who act like therapists do not lead to productive businesses. And it's hard because um, we care and we want our people to feel that we care and invest in that. I don't think we're swimming too far in the opposite direction. I think that could happen, but I haven't personally seen it happen. I still see organizations that need to invest a lot more here. But I'm glad that empathy is actually like a requirement for the job now and leadership at big companies like Microsoft. Um, yeah, I think we're the boomer generation still needs. They have some work to do in terms of um, hard. <laughs> Not all of the worst. My mom is me. <laughs> no, um, my mom is the most progressive. But um, there are a lot of leaders who uh, have had struggles connected with that, especially now, from the 80s. Yes. Okay. I, I was thinking about the situation that is you, you know, you started this company, but let's say you're in a room with all brand new hires. How do you bring up or, or bring across this empathy and how you run this company to a, a group of brand new employees and a company? Or maybe you started as their manager, so you've never met them before, and this is going to be your first time. How do you kind of broach that subject to say, you know, this is something that you might notice that is a little different? We included an orientation. So we have an orientation where we do um, three days, all the leaders come, we talk about their departments, but we also leave um, in empathy through those discussions, not just the HR discussions, but um, the CTO includes empathy in his orientation. Um, our head of security does. So it's, it's integrated in every single department and it starts at orientation. Would you have advice to someone like I, I manage a, a fairly large team? I would like to bring this out in them more. Is there something I can do to maybe uh, bring it out? I think it comes down. I really like these core values, um, and they're from Microsoft. But you know, we could modify them and change them and make them our own. But I really love number one the individual results. What business impact do you deliver contributing to the success of others? So it's not enough just to say, great, I'm glad that you accomplished your job today, but how did it impact other people? Um, and how did it help with the success of somebody else? If you're measuring people on this instead of just on individual results, that eliminates a lot of toxic behavior that you can see at work. Awesome. Okay. There was another question. Yeah, I am a not, I don't know you, so I'm just going to say, I call bullshit on the empathy because... On what? On, on an empathy at any company. Empathy at a company? At any company. At any company, okay. Because I've been in toxic situations and in each of them, and I've been in companies that claim to be empathetic and all that, but as soon as they bring up, hey, I'm experiencing targeted behavior based on who I am. HR steps in and bring, you know, and it's like, the one time when I need someone to be empathetic, HR reps in. Yeah. So I, I've never met, it, right now it's like, if I'm, if I'm in like a working group with an HR person, I like quietly excuse myself because literally HR professionals trigger me. I, I can agree more. I've seen it happen so many times. Luckily, we're a smaller company, only 25 people at this point. 
we're going to have like full time HR. Um, and so we're kind of in the kumbaya phase, but I've seen it happen. I went, I went from around seven to employees, like from employees to employees, and there were 600 people. Yeah. And so there was a huge build out HR department by the time I was there. And anytime you had an employee that you would put on a plan, HR had to be present. And it just became sort of a bigger thing where it was much more challenging to have. Uh, I know it's not what you're saying, but in terms of uh, that empathy piece. Yeah, the function of HR is really hard because they're almost like an extension of the orders in a way. Because it's their job, even though they say the best interest of the employees, oftentimes it's the best interest of the company to make sure they're not sued or whatever. Right. Um, and so, I mean, I don't think it's black and white where it's like you can't be empathetic and have HR. I think if it starts at the top and then you have departments who encourage it, that helps. I mean, HR in the business world is always going to eventually creep in. And I don't know how to solve for that, but I'm going to have to do this. Yeah, and the reason I bring that up is that I would say that right now you are in a compliance phase, I think it's small setups. And if you want your words right now to mean a little bit, you're the CEO. You have to solve for that problem. You have to solve for your HR. You know, hire that HR person. I've encountered so many HR people who I know more about harassment, harassment law than they do. I know more about how to communicate about gender diversity issues than they do. You know, so I'd say it's if you want in a year and a half from now, you have 250 that you actually have the same organization, I'd say, please make that your next challenge. Figure out how you're going to make your HR people care less about the company and more about the culture. I'd love to learn about companies where you're going to go but I haven't seen it. Yeah, I, I literally, like... Unless you have an HR department that doesn't report, like, to, usually they're for finance and big companies, and then the attorneys also report to finance. Yeah. And so it's it's just, I don't know, maybe change the reporting structure as part of it. I don't know. Well, you're the, you're the CEO. It's your problem. Figure it out, but I'm open to ideas for bigger companies. It's definitely for a longer conversation. Yeah. So, yes. yeah, keep that one going. Any, any other? One last one. How do you set boundaries when you're empathetic? you have so many team members that need so much from you, what is your so best? different things for them. Right. right, so yeah. what, are, what are your ideas on how to best set a boundary? I mean, you have to take care of yourself and you have to do for you, but when everybody wants everything, how do you empathetically say, this is all I can be for you? Are you talking about for me or for my employees? Like for you when you're dealing with employees, like how do you set that boundary of, I have enough for you to, this is all I can be. Yeah. Um, so I think because they know these are the hours that I walk off and I go to girls on the run practice, I think everyone's pretty respectful. I have employees who have different um, boundaries, as you put it, I like that. Um, my head of engineering is like, I uninstall and slap for my phone, and uh, that's my new thing. Um, and uh, he's available online in many hours, but he was working into like the morning and like we had to set his. And so we support that and support the CEO business doing this. Um, and that's all, that's all we can do. It's working really well so far, but it's definitely not a one size fits all. It works for Steve, it doesn't necessarily work for store users or other marketing. So um, we're just making sure that we're showing people that we can. This was a great talk. Um, I definitely learned a lot and things that I'm going to apply in my role as a manager. And even as a senior, I see. So I hope everybody else did too. Um, please, thank you.